Greetings. My name is Kevin Regick, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. Here, we're passionate about discussing real-life issues, and I do so from a Christian biblical perspective. Today's conversation addresses the desire to give us Barabbas. Uh, a subtitle would be, When Painful History Repeats Itself. And this will be a two-part conversation because it contains a lot for us to consider. So jump in the car and let's ride. The foundational main point of the Christian faith is the nailing of Jesus to the cross, his dying for our sins. Satan's greatest success, at least in his mind, was the nailing of Jesus to the cross. Satan didn't use a lone assassin to do this. What he did was use a corrupt religious and political system. When Jesus was arrested, the Jewish religious leaders uh, were all there. Hence, Jesus said, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But in this, your hour and the power of darkness. Jesus wasn't simply commenting on the fact that he was arrested at night. He was saying that these unjust rulers and Satan himself were having a moment of power. God allowed him to be arrested, to be taken by the power of darkness. The battle against racism, which is a darkness, isn't merely a fight against any individual, government, system, or law. It's a fight that confronts Satan and his demonic forces. It's a fight against Satan and his kingdom. And Satan attacks individuals through systems. He corrupts people and works through the unjust laws, practices, and traditions they create. And he does this both through the governments of this world and also through religious institutions that prize culture and tradition above the truth of God's word. If we believe the task of racial recognition is over, while divisions that slavery and segregation created between black and white churches remain, then we fail to see Satan's hand is still at work. Now, I know some of you will not want to hear this, or you will label this as hating against President-elect Donald Trump, but I pray you will listen and hear me out. For several years now, Mr. Trump had used racist dog whistles in public speaking on social media and even in secret recordings unknown to him. Dog whistles are one of the most discussed methods for politicians to play on voters' racial attitudes. And although they come in handy for manipulation on other topics as well, the key to a dog whistle is this hiding of what's really going on. Broadly speaking, a dog whistle is a bit of communication with an interpretation that seems perfectly innocent but which also does something else. It can send a clear coded message to those in the know, what I call an overt code dogs. Or it can work on its targets without their, them even knowing it. And this is what is called a convoit effect dog whistle. A dog whistle we have heard a lot over the past few years is immigration and immigrant. It has been connected to criminal, rapists, street and drug gangs, uh, drugs, human trafficking, etc. It is particularly potent because it can dog whistle so many different things, including racism, Islamophobia, uh, anti-Eastern European views, or simply xenophobia. Mr. Trump in the last days of his campaign, used the dog whistle of color as well. He's, he switched from his standard red and white cap and red tie to black and gold. 
these are the colors used by the Proud Boys. And he wore the black suit, golden yellow tie, black and gold hat lettering on October 25th at a campaign rally in Michigan. The Southern Poverty Law Center has declared the Proud Boys to be a North American far-right neo-fascist militant organization that promotes and engages in political violence and is a hate group. Now, dog whistles open doors for the hearers who understand to take action or to become alert or to stand by, so to speak. And apparently, someone or some group heard it and took action. The recent news about racist text messages being sent to uh, our children, middle schoolers and some high schoolers has caused fear, concern, anger, rage, disappointment, and outrage. And it is our responsibility to address these issues. So watch and listen to this. Tell me what's going on here as you see it. Well, you know, uh, on election night on uh, on PBS, after it became clear that um, Donald Trump was on his way to the presidency, that I said that I was concerned on on, a, on multiple levels. And the first level I said was I was concerned as an African American, and I was concerned as an African American because of the rhetoric used by Donald Trump on the campaign trail, saying that he wanted to um, let let police have a you know, a day, some sort of day of rage where they can get the crime situation under control in various cities. Well, the the the, the dog whistle there is that he's going to go after after black people, um, and so to see that these text messages were going out the day after he becomes president elect. Um, just feeds into the fear and concern that a lot of African Americans have about what is to come. And Chris, what is especially pernicious about this text messaging campaign is that some messages just said something like greetings, other messages said greetings and the person's name. And so how did they get the person's name? How did they get the person's uh, cell phone number? Where did they get this information to target specific people and now target specific people in multiple states across the country. You know, I know, you know we're in this moment where we're trying to come to grips with what just ha with what just happened. But I don't think we anyone, particularly in, in those of us in our profession, and I'm not saying that we're doing that here. I'm just you know doing a shot across the bow to others to not downplay the concern and the legitimate fears, particularly people of color and especially black people have as a result of the of uh, the election of Donald Trump to another term in the White House. Elections have consequences and the president elect's campaign was built on hate and grievance, which has contributed to an environment of hate, racial hatred, and racial terror that the NAACP has seen since its inception in 1909. Um, as Mr. Coleman has indicated, uh, there is a great deal of empowerment and joy among young Black Americans. And these messages are meant to tamp that down. But their proliferation is the evidence that when uh, you don't denounce hatred and you pr and you actually uh, promote it, there are consequences for fellow American citizens. Uh, these text messages are disturbing, but they are only beginning. Now, for those of you who may be forming in your lips to declare fake news, here is a copy of a text that was sent to the niece of one of my coworkers. It included her full name, which uh, authorities are still trying to figure out how did these individuals get access to people's names. And this is real. This is not limited to one location, one place, one section of the country. These texts went out to over 22 different states. This is disgusting. This is petty. And this is the action of power. Now, with that being said, let's first acknowledge the fear 
that this incident has caused. Fear for the safety and well-being of our children. Fear for the future of our society. Fear that is not uh, uh, just an isolated incident, but rather a reflection of a larger issue of racism that is still present in this country. And we must not ignore this fear, but rather use it to fuel our determination to be strong, united, determined, courageous, and vigilant for ourselves, our families, and our children. There is also understandable concern over the impact of these test messages that, that they may have on the young minds of these middle schools. Our children should not be exposed to such hateful and harmful language at such a young age. Yes, I know it's true that racism is real, it exists, and we should prepare our children of color to encounter it. I get that, got it, and agree with it. But there is a time, place, and age and stage for which that should take place. And that way it can be absorbed healthily, health, in a healthy and mature mind and personality. It is concerning that someone should possess such malice and use it to target innocent children. Now, what is this harm? Is the lack of public outrage that should be heard that I'm not hearing. At least I'm not hearing it from the right place. See, I'm not listening for outrage from the Black community. And to be honest, I'm not listening for it because this has become expected for many of us. We're surprised if it doesn't show us a ugly head. And maybe, just maybe, this is why Project 2025 in the state of Florida, for example, want to take American history out of the school system, particularly how it covers slavery. And the, and the project, in Project 2025, for example, it called for the next president of the United States, which will be Donald J. Trump, to issue an executive order and that Congress pass a law banning any federal funds from going forward to any school that teaches critical race theory, or CRT. Since for many right-wing policymakers, CRT means any study of race and racism, the impact of this could be... Uh, uh, squash any classroom conversation about structural or systematic racism in the United States and even on teaching of the effects and uh, the, the activities of slavery in America. Uh, it makes me wonder, actually, are the creators of Project 2025 afraid of revealing and providing some understanding of the hate that hate produced. You know, I, I plan to stay off of social media and posting for a while. That was my plan. But when my co-worker showed me the text, I started feeling what his brother must have felt when his daughter called him to tell him about the text and to ask him, what did it mean? Now, I could sit back because I have a sense of peace. Because although I am a in this human government, I am in this world, but I am not of it. I am a citizen of the United States, but I am also a citizen of the kingdom of God. And that is my primary citizenship. So in, in that, I can rest assured that the king in which, whose kingdom I am a citizen of, is going to take care of me. Okay? My crying out are for those who are not in the same mindset and understanding that I'm in. Not yet in. I'm crying out because I understand as a Christian 
The problem is not with the government or with the world. The problem is with the church. She has lost her way and is not functioning in her purpose of advancing the kingdom, of teaching the kingdom and its principles and concepts. The Apostle Paul made it clear for us in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, where he states, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, uh, uh, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, uh, naughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Like many of you, I've read this many times and always thought Paul was talking about the world. After all, it's in the world we find the blasphemers, the lovers of money, the disobedient, the parents, the unthankful, the unholy, the, the unloving, all the gaggers in the world. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Paul was talking about the church. Where am I getting that from? Well, he tells us, he uses a dog whistle, so to speak, in verse five, where he says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. See, the world is not trying to have a form of godliness. The world can care less about godliness. It's about self-pleasure, as we read in in the uh, in Paul's description. But all of that has now filtered into his church, and so because of that, the church is not functioning in power. So all they could do is put on a costume and start acting, pretending, be hypocritical. And in this, they have a form of godliness. Now, I'm not coming down on the church because I'm a Christian and been a church member and leader for some time. But the scripture says, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I believe somewhere in the back of Paul's mind as he wrote and penned this letter, was the understanding that the world, as an opposing force led by Satan, was waging a war against God and his people. And the war would take shape in many forms, platforms, methods. And God's people were to be ready for the attack of a hostile, hostile persecuting enemy. But surely one of the enemy's cruelest aspects of his attack was to have Satan's penetration into the church in the form of false teachers who would oppose the gospel with one of their own making and draw away the unsuspecting and unprepared. In light of current events, I must call upon and remind my fellow Christians, all those of, of black, brown, yellow, white persuasion, all those individuals who voted for President-elect Trump, that you are required to hold him and his administration accountable. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, many of you cast your vote uh, under the, the 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 presumption and the belief that Mr. Trump valued Christian principles, traditions, and policies, and that he is was not 
racist, but a God-fearing man who will invoke policies in line with biblical principles. Okay. But according to that assessment now, I am asking, and I am waiting, really. I'm waiting. I'm waiting because this is a moment right here. I'm waiting to hear him speak on this situation regarding these text messages to our children. See, because he is a leader of our nation now. More importantly, as some of you believe, he is a Christian leader. Also, I want you guys to let me know when a policy that Trump and his administration puts forth that is based on biblical principles and if you don't mind, line up the scripture with it that is based on and let me know. Because I am of a different opinion and persuasion regarding President-elect Trump. So if in holding him responsible, it can show that he is issuing policies based on biblical principles and teaching, then I will gladly offer a public apology and my support in those endeavors. But should that not be the case, then your responsibility in voting for him is to hold him and his administration accountable. Let's move on. Now, depending on whom you supported in the last presidential election, your heart was or still may be heavy or joyful. And scripture tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. So I want to take a moment to address you both. Over the past few days, many of the heavy hearted have been reflecting on one of the most confusing moments in American political history. In my contemplation, my mind journeyed to another confusing moment found in biblical history. That was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now I'm not referring to the crucifixion itself as confusing but the event that led to it as recorded in the book of Matthew chapter 27. And this event left me with a perplexing question that I was reminded of on November 6, 2024. And that question was, why did the people demand Barabbas over Jesus? At this point, Jesus had already performed countless miracles, healed the sick, and preached with a wisdom and authority that left all those who heard him amazed, including the scribes and the Pharisees. Yet, the crowd before Pontius Pilate chose to release a known criminal murderer and insurrectionist, Barabbas, in place of Jesus. Why did they make such a choice? Why did they reject one who could offer them so much more? One who had true concern for them? Let's take a look at the text. Matthew 27, 20, 26 says, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And he then had scourged Jesus and delivered him to be crucified. 
Like so many scriptures in the Bible, we can withdraw several lessons or messages from this account. For example, this account can be seen as a mirror reflecting our human nature. We can see ourselves in the crowd, demanding our selfish desires and interests over what is right and just. We are swayed by public opinion and peer pressure, even if it means going against what our hearts know to be true. An obvious view in the account is that of God's unending love and grace. Despite our weaknesses and failures, and in some instances, our own stupidity, he chose to give us his only son to die for us, to take upon himself the punishment for our sins so that we may have eternal life. In that moment when Barabbas was set free, it was actually you and I who were being set free because of an exchange of position between Jesus and Barabbas. Now, some theologians believe that the story of Jesus and Barabbas is not an historical account, but a distorted memory. And that the story of Barabbas could be an allegory representing Yom Kippur, thus making Jesus the ultimate sacrificial lamb. But let us also remember that we have been given the power to choose that was highlighted in this story. To choose righteousness over evil. To choose love over hate. To choose compassion over racism. And to choose Jesus over Barabbas. There are so many ways to view this account in scripture. And therefore, in the process of unpacking it, there are several rabbit holes we could start falling down. So in my attempt to avoid that and keep the purpose of my sharing with you, I'm taking the position that the story is an actual account. And in that, I will be focusing on simply the selection of Barabbas by the leaders and the people to paint my picture. Now, Barabbas was a prisoner of particular note, according to Matthew. He was an insurrectionist and murderer and rebel. And his mention in all four gospel accounts is significant. His name, Barabbas, is believed to be Aramaic, meaning son of the father. And some ancient manuscripts suggest that his full name may have been Jesus Barabbas though this remains uncertain. If that is to be true, that makes this even more interesting that we are presented with a choice to choose between which Jesus we're going to submit to. <laughs> anyway, the text tells us, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should Ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. We gotta be careful what Jesus are we destroying and what Jesus we're holding on to. The leaders of the community persuaded them to ask for the wrong Jesus, to ask for the release of Barabbas. The people were completely unaware of the intentions that and the motivation behind the leaders urging. The leaders had no concern regarding who Barabbas was, what he did, or what he may do. Their agenda was based on personal concerns. Much like many people who shared some of their concerns after voting, some shared concerns over them losing their place in the country, uh, the 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 black and browning of America, as it is called. Some issue concern over their personal finances and their desire to make more money and they believe they can do so under the person that they voted for. Some had issues with having a woman leader and so on and so forth. Anyway. Now, Polly could have released Jesus. However, he tried another political maneuver. He offered to turn over Barabbas, an evil thief and murderer, to be crucified instead. 
But the religious leaders and the angry crowd behind them rejected this offer. And Pilate once again revealed the fact that he knew Jesus was innocent. And he did so by responding, why? What has he done wrong? Yet the people cried, give us Barabbas. These religious leaders, like many today, engaged in name calling to invoke greater uh, fear in Pilate and further stir up the people. They called Jesus King of the Jews, which presumptuously was the title the Jewish leaders had, uh, had accused Jesus of assuming. It was more politically loaded than the title of Messiah. And therefore, it was one the governor could not ignore because to say that Jesus was the king was coming directly against not only Pilate, but Roman and, and the Roman government and the king of Rome itself, Caesar. So the governor really had no choice. It made Jesus a potential leader of rebellion. And it was actually on this charge that Jesus was eventually executed. And the people cried out, his blood is on us and on our children. Mm. That's how committed they were. That's how determined they were. That's how sure they were that this man was worthy of death. Now, I, 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 I know the uh, one of the other views we can take of this is that this was all in the will of God, and, and it was. But just stay with me because I'm, 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 that's not my line of presenting this particular text to us today. As I said, there's a lot of, 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 of things we can pull out of this text. This is what I'm choosing to 